Praise the Lord, everybody. Let's all stand in the house, and let's just begin to give God some glory in here. And let's just praise and worship him today with our praise team. Let's just step out in faith a little bit this morning and just show God how much we love him. Blessed assurance, Jesus is mine. Oh, what a foretaste, glory divine. Heir of salvation, purchased of God, born of his spirit, oh. I'm washed in his blood oh, And I can't stop singing oh, This freedom soul oh, I'm praising my Savior All the day long, all the day long I got a song and I'm singing now Praise is pouring out Praise is pouring out
on, let's lift our hands and magnify the Lord in this place. Can we do that? Can we just praise him for a moment? Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Glory, glory, glory. What a mighty God we serve. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. My, my, my. Hallelujah. What a God we serve, amen. Can we just give him a little more praise in this place? Come on, 30 seconds. You got 30 seconds in you. Just open your mouth and praise him. Hallelujah. I praise you, Lord Jesus. Come on, he's worthy of all of our praise. Hallelujah. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. Woo. There is a freedom in this place this morning. Amen. You may be seated for a moment. I couldn't help but think, uh, had a lot of things on my mind here of late. The pastor asked us this morning what we've been thinking about was something that's been kicking over in my head as a statement that a guy I used to work with that he would say. He said, when I get off work, Brother Shannon, me and my wife, we go home and we sit for some mindless entertainment. And that phrase has been kicking over in my head here of late, mindless entertainment. Philip Holmes said, chasing joy and entertainment is like chasing the dragon. The term is a slang phrase which refers to the continuous pursuit of the ultimate high previously obtained through the initial use of drugs. Brother Dave, when we chase entertainment, we chase things that make us feel good. And I feel like, Brother David, sometimes that we bring that into this place. We bring it into this place and we have the mentality or the mindset that I'm coming to be entertained. I'm coming to hear a song or I'm coming to hear a word that will make me feel better that when I leave this place, I'll feel good that I came. But I'm here to tell you today, if you heard this song that we just sang, what it says is I've got a song in my heart. There was something that happened to the man when Peter and him walked by and they grabbed him by the hand. They said, silver and gold have I none, but such as I have give I unto thee. The next place you hear about him, he's in the church worshiping and praising God. That nobody had to tell him to walk into that place. Nobody had to tell him to lift his hands and magnify. Nobody had to tell him to praise the Lord. He done it because something within him welled and something within him begin to burn because there was a praise that could not be contained. Amen? I believe there's some people under the sound of my voice that God has healed, that God has touched, that God has delivered and when you walk into this place no one needs to tell you you need to praise Him. No one needs to tell you you need to magnify Him because me for one can close my eyes, Brother Shannon and I can see where I was I can see the place I used to be and all of a sudden, something within me, Brother Terrence, begins to burn. And you know what happens then? I gotta lift my hands. I gotta open my mouth and I gotta say, God, I am who I am only because of who you are. I'm only here today because of your mercy. I'm only here today because of your grace. So one more time, I want somebody in this place to open their mouth, to praise him, to magnify him, to give him some glory and to give him some praise because he is the only one that is worthy in this place today. Hallelujah. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. I never want to enter into this place with an entertain me spirit, but I want to come with a mindset, God, I know what you've done for me. And I'm coming in there to tell my brothers and sisters to uplift them, to benefit them, and to let them know, hey, he is alive, he is well, and he is on the throne, amen. And I will praise him with everything that is within me, amen. One more time, let's give the Lord a hand clap of praise and thank him for his goodness and his mercy in this place today. Hallelujah. Sister Scarlett, if you can. Give them the ways to give up there on the board today. We have GiveLify and PayPal available at riverbendpentecostals.com. You can send your cash and checks to be mailed to Riverbend Pentecostals, 
1031 Mill Street, P.O. Box 477, New Madrid, Missouri, 63869. We have text to give, which is 833-883-9311. And all of you, the will is stand today and pray this prayer. Pray it like you mean it. Amen. Upon the authority of your word, I have given, and it shall be given unto me. Pressed down, shaken together, and running over. I'm a tither, and I give my offerings, and I bring them today into your storehouse. Therefore, the enemy is rebuked, and the curse is broken, and I live under an open heaven. You pour out upon me such a blessing that there is not enough room to receive it. We receive jobs and better jobs, raises and bonuses, sales and commissions, benefits and settlements, estates and inheritances, interest and incomes, rebates and returns, checks in the mail, gifts and surprises, bills paid off, debts demolished, and royalties received. My whole family saved. And serving God in perfect health and abundance, walking in divine favor and blessings. I'm blessed going in, and I'm blessed going out. And all that I do will prosper in Jesus' name. And the church said, Amen. Amen. God bless you. Come and give with what the Lord has blessed you with this morning.
Oh, I'm thankful that the Lord is in this place. He conquered death and the grave. That way we can have what we have in this place, a place of freedom, a, pay, a place of belonging. I was riding today, and I was thinking about Jacob, how he wrestled with the angel because he was in need of something. He needed something, Brother Shannon. And he said, I'm not letting go until you bless me. Until you meet my need, I'm going to stay wrestling. I want to ask, when's the last time that we wrestled to the break of day? When's the last time that we got along where it was just us and the Lord and say, Lord, I'm not leaving this place until you fix something in me. Until you change something that is in me that is broken, that is jacked up. That is just making me not to be the person that I need to be. When's the last time that you got down to business with the Lord? He's here. He's always here. He never wants us to leave this place the same way we came. There's been a lot of times that I've lost, that I've left the church the same way that I've came. We don't. We're not always promised tomorrow, and this is not to scare nobody, but I don't want to leave this service the same way that I came when I know that there is a God in this place that can do exceedingly and above all that we can have. We don't have to go to somebody once, once a year, Brother Shannon, but we can come every time. That whether we come to church or whether we go to our special place, we can come into the presence of the Almighty. Where's our hunger at? Where's our hunger for change? Where, where is the thing that is burning inside of us that says I need something different? Yeah. The world ain't doing for me what I thought it would do. Yeah. But I need something real. I need something real, Brother Shannon. I need something that's going to grab a hold of me. It's going to transform me. It's going to place me in the purpose that he called me to. There is a God here today that wants to meet us that wants to get down to business with us, but I think it's going to take, are you willing to step out? Are you willing to get past that place of comfort? Are you willing to step out into the unknown and say, Lord, I don't know if you can change me, but I'm not leaving here until you do. I'm going to stay here and I'm going to fight for what I want. I'm going to grab a hold of something and I'm not letting go until you change me. I'm talking about the real change. I'm talking about the change that transforms us to be something more for the world. Let's just go into prayer right now, but with, with a place that says, I want more. I want more than what I've always been. I want something different in my life. Let's go today with realness, with sincerity, with an honest heart. Lord, we love you. Lord, we can't change nothing about our situation, but I know that you can. I know that you can step into my, cir my circumstances and I know that you can perform the work that needs to perform today. And Lord, I don't know what the outcome's going to be, but Lord, I know when I show up with realness and I show up with everything that I have, I need, I know that you can meet it. And I know that you can do exceedingly and above all that we can ask or think by the powers that work within us. Lord, you are here today. Lord, you are in this place, Lord. Your spirit has showed up, Lord. Your spirit has fallen upon us. And God, I pray that today, Lord, there will be some hearts changed. There will be some people transformed by the renewing of their mind. And they will be loosened out of the depression and anxiety and just everything that the world wants to put on them. Break the change that is in this place today, oh God. Transform us into the person that you created us to be. Because we were created for more than what we are. And Lord, I'm praying that you will just loosen us today in this place, oh God.
Cause this home belongs to the Lord So I'm not afraid to remind him That he has no claim in this war I plead the blood
some praise one more time in this house. You clap your hands, lift your voice, lift your voice like a trumpet. Hallelujah. Jesus is in this room today. The Holy Ghost is rich in here, full tell you why. There's been some folks praying. There's been some folks sacrificing of their time, their effort, and their energy because they want more. Jesus is in the house today because somebody prayed for you. I want to make sure the Lord's had a chance to touch everybody in here. It's a blessed day. We've had one receive the Holy Ghost already. We're going to baptize three at the conclusion of service.
that's within me. Hallelujah. You stand with me for just a moment, and you're able. Give that chair a rest. I want us to pray real quickly. I don't have a text in the traditional sense today, so I want us to pray. Teresa wants to receive the Holy Ghost. Tanya's already received the Holy Ghost. We'll baptize both of them and Lena after service. We've got some children planning to be baptized very shortly. Some that have been coming without their parents. God's moving, folks. He's, there's some things he can't do. The reason is, is because he needs you to move through. He needs you to move through. You got to respond. So I ask you to pray with me. Lord, in the name of Jesus, I thank you for your presence that's here today. I thank you for the demonstration of the spirit and the power. I thank you, Lord, for the wheat and I thank you for the tares. I thank you, God, for the hungry, and I thank you, Lord, for those that don't know they're hungry. I pray, God, that you will anoint me to deliver this marvelously anointed word. There's a lot here today to talk about. I pray you'll let the ground be broken up, the turn road broken up, the stones moved out, the thorns plowed under. I pray, God, that it fall on good ground, that the word fall on good ground in Jesus' name. Today I'm going to preach on the reproduction of Pentecost. You may be seated. This is Pentecost Sunday. It's the 50th day after the Passover, the day which Jesus Christ was killed, crucified. This is the anniversary of the birth of the New Covenant Church. It was in Egypt. And finally... Holy Ghost not letting me go yet. Holy Ghost don't want me to start just yet. Um, not because he wants to speak to us. That's not what's happening right now. But what's happening right now is the Lord's giving you a chance yeah. to be free from whatever's holding you back. It's your day. This is your moment. I'm going to share a couple of stories with you in this, in this message today that are designed to grip your heart and my heart. And I know you got to take care of the babies. And I know you got to go to the bathroom sometimes curse of the river bend is you have to go to the bathroom all the time during church. <laughs> Several times a service, some of us six or eight or ten. Um, we're going to start raising money by making our toilets pay toilets. <laughs> and we will build a new building by January of next year. We may not make them pay toilets. We may just create a lottery whereby you pay for your chance to go. <laughs> and I'm just half being funny. Half trying to be funny. Because I am 51 years old now, and I know what it means to have to go to the bathroom more than you used to have to go to the bathroom. And I know what it means to have to hold it at church because all of them's full yeah. and got a line. And I like y'all, but I don't like you enough to stand in line and visit while we wait on the bathroom. <laughs> but the Holy Ghost is moving in this house today. The power of God is here in a heavy, mighty, beautiful way. I pray against the spirit of intimidation. And I pray against the spirit of pride and arrogance. And I pray against the rebellious spirit. And I'm going to tell you in the Holy Ghost, some of you are waiting on the praise team, the service leaders, or the pastor 
to do something for you that only you can do for yourself. And that is make yourself available to what God has for you. So I'm going to try to begin this message again. Never preached it before. Um, I've been saving these stories for three or four years. Finally, this important part of plan of God's plan is coming to fruition. It was first pictured in his mind before he created the world. One might argue that he created the world to bring this plan to pass. Because Jesus Christ was the lamb slain from the foundation of the world. This plan will finally find the avenue down through which redemption will come for all of mankind. Under the blood, the evidence of obedience over 400 years of servitude and slavery will be destroyed as a type of the redemption of all mankind. This is known as the exodus. It involves leaving a bondage behind, going through the water and under the divine direction of the Spirit, first a cloud and then a pillar of fire, none of which would have been possible without the dividing power of the obedient blood. Obedience involving the blood would save while failure, everybody say failure. failure. Ignorant failure, which means you didn't know what to do, or willful failure, which means you did and didn't do it, either of those will result in judgment. And the penalty being the death of the firstborn of every house not covered by the blood. This is the implementation of the Passover. A plan put into place by God involving obedience and sacrifice. The inhabitants of each home would take a lamb. They would kill that lamb and take the blood and they would paint each side of the door along with the header of the door with the blood. That night, the children of Israel were leaving Egypt. There would be an exodus. Those that would be saved were saved simply by applying the blood. When he saw the blood upon the doorpost, the death angel would pass over that house. But if there was no blood, then judgment would hit that family and the penalty would be the death of the firstborn of that home. This miraculous deliverance from Egypt. Between three and five million people would leave Egypt in one night. They would go from broke slaves to wealthy heirs, from bound to free, from weak to strong, from hopeless to hopeful in one night through one avenue of obedience. And it is a picture of what God wants to do in the life of every man, woman, boy, or girl who will leave behind their own bondage, obediently following the word of God into the promised land for which they were created. This miraculous deliverance from Egyptian bondage would come to be the most memorable occasion in the history of the Jewish people. And as the Jewish people began to be established, both in the wilderness and in the promised land, they were given by God some, some things they were to remember each year through what he called feast. The first and most important is the feast commemorating the Exodus and the establishment of Israel as a nation by God's redemptive act. This feast is called Passover. It was to be celebrated on the first month of the religious year, which is the 14th day of Nisan, which is April for us, and this feast lasted seven days. Ooh, help me now, Holy Ghost, I need you. During the time of Passover, it was, or excuse me, during the time of Jesus Christ, it is estimated that the regular population of Jerusalem was 25,000 people. However, it is believed that up to 2.5 million Jews from as close as 15 miles away to the far reaches of the earth would make a pilgrimage to Jerusalem for Passover. 
We see it in the life of Jesus when at the age of 12, it tells us that he was taken to, to Jerusalem for the Passover and they celebrated Passover and they stayed there a few days and, and a, a whole company, a whole caravan of them went and they all thought Jesus was with some other part of the caravan. You remember that? And he stayed in the synagogue three days. The Bible says that his parents went every year, Brother David. Up to two and a half million people. 2.5 million people. That is more people that's in St. Louis or more people than is in Kansas City. More people than is in most every metropolitan area, Memphis or whatever's in our range. They all journeyed to Jerusalem, sleeping in tent cities, inconvenient, no place for them to stay, staying out in the streets, living in the parks, whatever area was around, sharing sharing land with the sheep or the goats or whatever. These are folks that were committed to commemorating and obeying the word of God. They have come to worship. They have come to magnify God. They have come to celebrate the truth that God had delivered their people from Egyptian bondage and established them here in the promised land. It is during this time that Jesus is betrayed by Judas, taken captive, abused, mistreated, beaten, and ultimately crucified, buried, and rose from the dead. There's a certain tragedy to the picture presented of countless deeply religious folk who have made the trek to Jerusalem for Passover, devoutly worshiping, devoutly gathering together and celebrating freedom from bondage while within a stone's throw of where they partied, of where they celebrated. It was not worldly, Brother David. It was not irreverent. It was devout. It was godly. They loved God and they celebrated what he had done, but a stone's throw away. A soldier was beating the back of Jesus Christ. A stone's throw away, they crammed thorns down upon his head. A stone's throw away, he was being killed, hung on a cross. What grief would have been present in the spirit? What a heaviness at the price being paid for sin's penalty upon everybody. The death of a Savior, but not only his death, but also his burial and his resurrection all took place during Passover. And they worshiped, and they had church, and they went to the synagogue, and they sang their songs. This shows us perhaps the difference in being religious and the aspect of awareness that only will come from the baptism of the Holy Ghost. They worshiped and they fellowshiped within walking distance of Calvary and the tomb and they missed it. They were still having church while Jesus was dying, being buried and rising again. We must beware of being so religious that we don't pick up what the Spirit's doing that there is a world hurting and wounded and most important, hopeless, and they haven't found what they're looking for even in religion. We cannot just be different by the way we look or the things we do or the things we don't do, but we have to be different in, in marching to the beat of a spirit to lead us in places that might even sin, offend our sense of, of Pentecostal propriety and be brought back to a Pentecost that came from the mind of God and not the mind of man. We cannot create a religion that suits our sensibilities and makes us happy and makes us feel good, Brother Larry. We cannot be content with just having church. Because I'm going to tell you right now, honey, 
There are some of us in here right now that are feeling the power of the Holy Ghost because somebody else prayed and somebody else fasted and we have become content just showing up and getting the spill over. But I'll tell you right now, the devil will let you get blessed six days a week and twice on Sunday as long as you don't go do what God called you to do. Several years ago, Reverend Robert Rodenbush, Brother Paul Mooney's son-in-law, wrote this sobering article, and I will condense it for time. I sure hope y'all listening. Not because pastors got so much beautiful things to say. Matter of fact, I've been praying. Lord, don't let him, my voice just become noise. Elmina Castle, located east of Ghana, West Africa's capital city of Accra. It's on the Cape Coast region, beautiful stretch of land, marvelous seas, beautiful land, and it's home to many fishing villages there now. Elmina Castle is a whitewashed stone building. I had some pictures of it today, but I... I didn't ask for them to be put up, but it has stood there on the coast of West Africa since 1482, which for clarification purposes would have been 10 years before Columbus sailed the ocean blue, the Nita, the Pinta, the Santa Maria. Y'all remember that? 1482 it was built. It was built by the Portuguese as a trading outpost for gold and other exports and to house missionaries. Quickly, however, they discovered, come on, stay with me just a little bit, just a little bit, but you can't afford to miss this. Just as powerful as I'm preaching it, I'm, I'm, what I'm trying to do, Brother Jerry, is I'm trying to be God right now, and I ask you to forgive me for that because I see us staring off into space and I see us fidgeting around and getting on our phone and a whole bunch of other things, and I really want to say, please pay attention to this but I'm going to have to let God be God. So just forgive me. Forgive me for meddling stuff that ain't none of my business. This castle built in 1482 for a trading outpost for gold and other exports and place for the missionaries to live. But very quickly they found out that there was a whole lot more money in trading people than there were goods. And in the 1500s, the transatlantic slave trade began and lasted for more than 300 years from this place, captured and operated both by the Dutch and the British. The tour of Elmina Castle is sobering. To see the actual location where the atrocities of the slave trade were performed is completely disturbing. These slaves would be led down through the catacombs of the dungeons and they would ultimately walk out a very small, narrow, window-like opening that was ironically nicknamed the point of no return. Separated from their wives and from their children, valued only based upon the muscle and the bone that would become a laborer that, that would make them be valuable to somebody else. They, they were shackled together five people to a chain and loaded into ships like cargo, perpetrating incredible evil upon another human being. But Brother Rodenbush goes on to say, you can Google this, it's, I didn't make it up, he didn't make it up, you can Google it, it's true. The most egregious sight at Elmina is right in the middle of the courtyard stands a church. It's a focal point. Everything is pointed toward the church. The Europeans who occupied the castle were said to have conducted services there. Despite the original mission of the missionaries who came to stay there, the original mission was to reach those of African descent. However, as it became a slave trading outpost, the doors were locked to those that lived in its prisons. 
The church, hear me right now, hear this preacher. The church existed so that life could proceed as normally as possible for the governor of the castle, the officers, and their families, and the missionaries, many of whom lived in luxury protected by the same walls in which were confined and imprisoned the precious souls deemed merchandised and marked for torture and trade. But it gets better or worse, whatever your pleasure. One tour guide told us that during the services, the missionaries, the soldiers, and other attendees had to sing their hymns so loudly so they could block out the cries of the slaves starving to death beneath their floor. Stay with me now. I came across, it's getting closer to home now. I came across this article written by James Robinson. Recently, a concerned friend handed me a very important book. The title of the book is When a Nation Forgets God, written by Dr. Erwin Lutzer, who pastored the Moody Church for 30 some odd years. In his book, Pastor Lutzer shared an eyewitness account of how some church members reacted to the Nazism of their times. He said, I lived in Germany during the Nazi Holocaust and I considered myself a Christian. We heard stories of what was happening to the Jews but we tried to distance ourselves from it because what could we do to stop it? A railroad. A railroad track ran behind our small church. Brother Larry, I picture in Lilburn right now, a little white building, railroad track right behind it. That could be us. And each Sunday morning, we could hear the whistle in the distance. And then the wheels coming over the tracks. We became disturbed when we heard the cries coming from the train as it passed by. We realized that it was carrying Jews like cattle in the cars. Week after week, the whistle would blow. We dreaded to hear the sound of those wheels because we knew that we could hear the cries of the Jews en route to a death camp. Their screams tormented us. We knew the time the train was coming, and when we heard the whistle blow, we began singing hymns. By the time the train came past our church, we were singing at the top of our voices. If we heard the screams, we sang loudly until we could hear them no more. Then the eyewitness said, though the years have passed, I still hear the train whistle in my sleep. God forgive me. God forgive all of us who called ourselves Christians and yet did nothing to intervene. It happened at Passover in Jesus' day, Brother David. It happened in Ghana, West Africa in the 15, 16, 17, and 1800s. It happened in Germany in the 1940s. And my greatest fear is that it's happening at 1031 Mill Street in 2024. Several hundred years later, in vastly different settings, the same fearful apathy enveloped these people. Good people with good intentions, but something was missing, something they left behind, something they let go of, something they forgot, or maybe they never even possessed it. Acts 2 and 5 says, And there were dwelling at Jerusalem Jews, devout men out of every nation under heaven. Devout means devoted to the worship of God. The original Greek word means God-fearing and desiring to fulfill religious obligations. They were not bad people. But they had got so good at being religious that they did not know that a battle for the lives of all humanity was taking place just across the road. You see, Brother David, I've been there now. And you can stand in Jerusalem 
to look down into Gethsemane. You can stand in Jerusalem literally and see where Golgotha is. You can see where they hung him at. But two and a half million people were still going to church. I just wonder if you lag, the Bible doesn't say this, but I just wonder if when he lifted up his head and cried, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me, that somebody didn't turn to their neighbor and said, crank up the volume a little bit. Somebody's hollering. Sing a little louder now. Up to two and a half million people would come for Passover. It lasted for seven days. Fifty days later, less than two months, one estimate said at least a quarter of a million of them would stay for Pentecost. The Bible said they believed in God. They were committed to the worship of God. But 50 days have passed in which the entire gospel has been lived out. From all appearances, they didn't get it. The Bible tells us, I believe it's in 1 Corinthians. I know it's in Paul's writings to the Corinthian church. That above 500 people saw Jesus after his resurrection. 5,000 men besides the women and children were fed. 4,000 men besides the women and children were with him for miracles of healing. They were the recipients of the largest all-you-can-eat buffet ever in history. Where are they now? And it would seem that above 500 saw him. Brother Terrence, they saw him face to face after knowing that he was nailed to the tree carried to a tomb, and he rose from the dead. And they saw him. Above 500 saw him. Brother David, only 120 stayed in the upper room. What's going on? These are devout people. They're good people. They're godly people. They believe in God. They worship God. Don't they? Acts 2, 1 through 4, when the day of Pentecost was fully come, they were all with one accord in one place. And suddenly there came a sound from heaven as of a rushing mighty wind, and it filled all the house where they were sitting. And there appeared to them cloven tongues like as a fire, and it set upon each of them. And they were all filled with the Holy Ghost and began to speak with tongues as the Spirit gave the utterance. And there were dwelling at Jerusalem Jews Devout men out of every nation under heaven. Verse number six says, Now when this was noised abroad, that 120 people had experienced the sound of a rushing mighty wind, and they all began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit gave the utterance, this was noised abroad. The multitude came together and were confounded because that every man heard them speak in his own language. In verse 7, and they were all amazed and marveled. And Brother Ronnie, they'd been here before. They were all amazed and marveled, saying one to another, Behold, are not all these which speak Galileans? So these are all people from the same place, 120 from the same place. They speak the same language, but now we're hearing them Every man saved words in our own tongue which we were born out of every nation under heaven. Parthians and Medes and Elamites and dwellers in Mesopotamia and Judea and Cappadocia, Pontius and Asia, Phrygia and Pamphylia in Egypt, parts of Libya about Cyrene and strangers of Rome, Jews and proselytes, Cretes and Arabians. Fifteen different nations are mentioned here just in passing. We do hear them speak in our tongue the wonderful works of God. And they were all amazed and were in doubt, saying one to another, what meaneth this? Now they're all drawn again. It's nothing new. They were drawn when he fed 5,000. They were drawn when he fed 4,000. They were drawn when all the Jews said, don't like him no more, and they said, we won't hate him, kill him. They were all drawn, flavor of the week, flavor of the month, whatever's going on, they're all drawn. What will be different this time? 
Peter began to preach to them from Acts 2 and 14 through Acts 2 and 36, ending with God has made that same Jesus whom you crucified, both Lord and Christ. Verse 37 says, now when they heard this, they were pricked in their heart. I watched you two weeks ago. I've referenced you a couple of times. I watched you when the power of the Holy Ghost began to fill this place just like it did earlier, and I watched you grab your heart. So powerful was the pull that you grabbed a hold of your heart and looked longingly not at your neighbor but into the heavens, wanting a part of what God was doing. Now when they heard this, they were pricked in their heart. You look it up, the word means poked all the way through, speared all the way through, not just on goosebumps, but something that reached way down inside of him past the mask and past the facade and past the stubbornness and past the rebellion and past the obstinance and past just... It reached down inside of them where they really live. And so they turned to Peter. These know-it-all religious leaders, Brother Shannon, they know the Bible backwards and forwards. They, they said, you know, wave Hosanna, Hosanna one week, crucify him the next week, and now they're back in the upper room. And they said, men and brethren, what shall we do? Then Peter said unto them, repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins. That's why you get baptized. You don't get baptized to make a good show in front of everybody, and you don't get baptized so we can say we had three get baptized. You get baptized to get your sins washed away. And you shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. Verse 39. For the promises unto you. Who, me? Yeah, you. For the promises unto you and to your children and to all them that are afar off, even as many as the Lord our God shall call. So what does that mean? I'm saved. That is the beginning of the new birth. That is the new birth, the beginning of the new life. It is not the top of the mountain. It is not the ultimate. It's actually the ultimate do-over. So I don't care what you've been through, and I'm not going to be preaching much longer, but I don't care what you've been through. I don't care what kind of doo-doo you drug in here with you this morning. I don't care. I don't care who you hurt. I don't care who has hurt you. I don't care where your feet have taken you, your eyes have looked at, your ears have listened to, your nose has smelled, or your mouth has said. It does not matter. Oh, precious is the flow that makes me, that makes me. I know what that means, Brother Jerry. That makes me. Brother Dustin, I know what that means. I know what that means. White as snow. No other fount I know. Nothing but the blood of Jesus. For the promises unto you. But what exactly does all of this mean? I would argue today that Jesus Christ told them what it meant before it ever got started. When in Acts 1 and 8 he said, but you shall receive power after that the Holy Ghost is come upon you and you shall be witnesses unto me in both in Jerusalem and in all Judea and in Samaria unto the uttermost parts of the earth. The key to sustenance is reproduction. We learned in being a servant of God last week or maybe the week before that every church is only one generation from extinction. And human nature 
is to get bored and find something new. Jesus said, you're the light of the world. You're a city set on a hill. You're the salt of the earth. And he said, after that, the Holy Ghost has come upon you. You shall receive power. That word dunamis means ability to be a witness unto Jesus Christ. When we spiritually reproduce, see new souls filled with the Spirit, that is the only thing that will keep us from getting bored with what God is doing. The awareness of what God is doing will never dissipate as long as I regularly see him in action. As long as it's being reproduced. The Holy Ghost says today, you have cried in your calamity. You feel as if you are destined to perish. You feel that you will die unfulfilled. But the Spirit says today, is it addiction that has you bound? Look around you. He has seven years clean from meth. She has one and a half years clean from alcohol. She has 30 days clean from opioids. Is it the stress of being single parent and being lonely? Look around you. She's now been married nearly 30 years and God has blessed her family and her home. Is it depression and anxiety? Look around you. She once brought tension and she once brought conflict, but now she brings peace when she comes. Is it childhood trauma from all different kinds of abuses? Have you been ashamed and have you been ridiculed and have you been maligned? He was mistreated. Look around you. He was mistreated. He was abused and they told him he was worthless. But now he's a husband. He's a daddy. He's a provider. And his family is blessed. The Lord has heard your cry as you stand with me. He has sent you to a place where you can see the evidence of his work in their lives. The only way that it won't die is if you keep it alive. He said you'll receive the ability to be a witness unto me ultimately in all the world. Or will we just sing loud? When you hear the, when you hear the whistle blowing, will you strike up the band? We're going to teach it Wednesday night. I'm just going to tell it to you now. Those who have not developed according to the plan of God have not done so, Brother Derek, because they forgot what God has done for them. That's in the Bible. They don't remember what it was like to stink like sin. They don't remember what it was like when they weren't accepted. They just feel like they've arrived now. What's going to stop it from being flavor of the month? What's going to stop it from being another fish and loaf smorgasbord? What's going to stop it from just being today's excitement? It's going to be, I'm a witness. You can do what you want. You can say what you want, but I'm a witness. I serve a merciful God. Amen. I serve a God full of grace. Oh, oh, oh. And he loves me. Loves me. 
you should have been there with me when I was crying myself to sleep. You should have been there with me when the devil told me, not, not this time, you went too far, stupid. You should have been there with me when I came to church, Brother Cody, and I did not know if I would feel his presence again. Sister, lean in. He didn't just give me the Holy Ghost so I could join the club. He gave me the Holy Ghost so I could be a witness. And it's through that ability to be a witness that the church stays alive. Because when Sister Peaches hears my testimony and it's right where she's living, something says inside of her, wait a minute. If he'll do it for him. He'll do it for me. And all of a sudden, something called faith rises up. Where once there was hopelessness, where once there was despair, where once there was defeat, where once there was shame, I got a glimpse of something better. The reproduction of Pentecost is when I allow the power of God to flow through me as a witness of Jesus Christ. I've been frustrated lately. This praise team's incredible. If y'all ever go to church anywhere else, visit somewhere else, even some big meetings, I'm going to tell you right now, this bunch right here is bad. <laughs> but God have mercy on us if we'll celebrate when they sing, allowing it to drown out the cries of a world all around us. And what is more, saints of God, ladies and gentlemen, while you sit there on your carcass and don't move, you refuse to worship somebody sitting over in a corner and they're watching you and they know what God has done for you, but it looks like maybe God has forgotten you and it looks like maybe God has abandoned you and it looks like maybe you don't love God like you used to. You can't afford to do nothing when you come to the house of God. You can't afford to not respond because you are a witness. Does that make sense? Yeah. I, there are people in this room right now. They didn't sleep good last night because they wondered if this may be their last day. They wondered. But I say, look around you. You're in a cloud of witnesses. Whoa! You don't know like I know what he's done for me, but I want to tell you. I want to tell you. You can't tell it like I can, so hear me tell it. God, that's so bad. I know how I see it. I want them to respond. I just thought maybe in floods and, and those that said here, there, and yonder that, that, that shut me down and they plug their ears and, and they get on Facebook and bellyache about the songs and get on Facebook and bellyache about the sound and get on Facebook and bellyache about they don't get their seed and get on Facebook and bellyache about how we've run the church by bringing all these witnesses here. I want them to wake up, Lord. I don't want them to be lost. I love them. I pray for them. So in this room, in this room, I know you're here. I know you're here. And I pray the Spirit right now will lead you to a witness who will bolster your faith and you will step out of your seat and say, Lord, here's the only way I know to say it. 
I want you to do for me what you did for them. Because I will not leave. I will not quit. I will not back down. I will not stop. I will not be silent. I will not stop clapping my hands. I will not stop lifting up my hands. I will not stop lifting my voice. I will not stop dancing in the spirit. I will not stop leaping for joy. I will not stop. him work it for your oh, good. Oh, he's not finished! Cause he's not done with what he started. Oh, saint of God, respond! He's not he's done, not done until, until, it's until it's good! It's good. Oh, hello, Let peace! Him turn it, let him turn it in your favor. Come on, we can't just stand and watch today. Somebody's watching. It's going to die. If you be quiet, if you be silent, it's going to die. He's not done with what he started. He's not done until.
Hallelujah. This is Lena. Lena wants to be baptized in Jesus' name. Keep on praying. Keep on praying. This is all worship. This is all worship. Let's pray for Lena right now. Lord, in the name of Jesus, I pray for Lena. She desires things from you, Lord, that you're going to provide. I believe, God, she's going to go down in this watery grave and come up carrying the name of Jesus, filled with the baptism of the Holy Ghost. I pray, God, that you will bless her, bless her family, bless her friends, bless those that are close and those that are far off through this witness of what you are doing in this young lady's life. In the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, amen. Put your hands down beside you. Lena Barnett, upon the confession of your faith and the teaching of the apostles, I now baptize you in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of your sins, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost in Jesus' name. to us through the mission and uh, for the mission and now she's going to carry on the mission. Amen? Amen. We're going to pray for Tanya. Lord, in the name of Jesus, I pray over Tanya. I pray, God, that what's getting on her will permeate the mission, permeate her home, her family, everyone that's close to her or far away from her. I pray the power of the Holy Ghost will begin to operate through her, function through her. I pray you will bless everybody that's connected to her. I pray the name of Jesus will be loosed in her life as she takes on that powerful, beautiful, only saving name in the name of the Lord Jesus. Tanya Strickland, upon the confession of your faith and the teaching of the apostles, I now baptize you in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins, and you shall, and you already have received the gift of the Holy Ghost in Jesus' name. Miller. Yes, yes, yes. The Holy
Holy Ghost got on this girl first time she ever came here. She fell in love with the river bend. She fell in love with everything and everybody around here. And the Lord fell in love with her. That's why she's here. Amen. So we're going to baptize Teresa, but we're going to pray for Teresa Miller. Lord, in the name of Jesus, I believe, God, you are fixing to baptize this young lady with the Holy Ghost. Not only is she going down in water for the remission of her sins and taking on your name, but she's going to be filled with the Holy Ghost to walk in newness of life. I believe, God, she will come up filled with your spirit. I pray, Lord, you'll give her the courage to just respond to the infilling of the Holy Ghost. I pray you'll give her the courage to do what she needs to do. Bless her family. Bless everyone connected with her. Bless her friends. Bless her children. Bless her my brothers and sisters. Whoever's connected, God, I pray that they feel the power of the Holy Ghost. I pray through Teresa. In Jesus' name. So Miller, upon the confession of your faith and the teaching of the apostles, I now baptize you in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of your sin, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost in Jesus' name. This is Mark Manley. He came, he came to see us about 
Uh, he told me about a year and a half ago, something like that. Is that right? When you came to recovery the first time? Yeah, a couple years ago, maybe he came to recovery and he showed up back here a couple weeks ago. Now he's been to two services, I think, right? Maybe one recovery, now he's here. And God's doing a work in his life. He's doing a work in his life. Let's pray for Mark right now. confession of your faith and the teaching of the apostles. I now baptize you in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of your sins and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost in Jesus Christ.
praise the Lord. Why don't we just clap our hands unto the Lord? In his works, wonderful. Isn't he mighty? You can't tell me the Holy Ghost isn't for everybody. You can't tell me. I've seen them feel drug addicts. I've seen them feel people that's broken. I've seen them feel people that it's for everybody. Amen. Hallelujah. We got a few announcements this week. As we make our way to our seats. Youth prayer meeting this Monday night at 6.30 p.m. Junior high camp, ages 12 through 15, is May 28th through June 1st. Senior high camp is ages 15 through 18, is June 4th through June 8th. Both camps are $200 per camper. Parents must have their campers registered and paid through the link at moyouth.com by May 22nd. Please don't wait until the last minute to register. It's a lengthy process. And the pastor has to sign off on his part, too. Please don't put him in a bind. Amen. <laughs> Junior camp, ages 8 through 11, is July 8th through the 12th, $170 per camper. $25 is due by June the 1st. And the remainder will be due when we leave. Please let Sister Casey know ASAP if you are going. All camps are at Pine Crest Campground, Cherokee Pass. Section 4 ladies meeting is tomorrow evening, May 20th at 7 p.m. at Jesus Name Tabernacle in Carruthersville. And focus prayer will be Saturday, May 25th. Sign up sheet is in the back. We need as many people praying as we can get. Prayer is going to make a huge difference. Uh, VBS will be July 17th through the 19th. The theme is Glow for Jesus. There is a box in the foyer for donations. Anything glow-related, glow sticks, neon glow in the dark, black, plastic, tablecloths, pool noodles, any color balloons, etc. We are also asking for volunteers. Just text HELP to the church number and choose which category you'd like to help with. To register your child, text GLOW to the church number. We need to support our children. We need every all hands in. Come on. Amen. And uh, we also have a sign-up sheet in the back. I believe it is for June 8th. But we are going, the men are going to have a 2v2 basketball tournament. And uh, there's an option. You can have a third person as a sub. But uh, a little closer to time, depending on how many teams we have signed up, we'll make the bracket. It will either be single elimination or double elimination. But we need everybody involved. All men are invited to come out. If you don't want to play... We need people to keep score. We need people to um, call fouls. We need people to just come be support. We need hecklers. We got enough competition in this place. Somebody needs to come humble somebody. Everybody needs to get involved. But it will be $20 a team, and, and all money will go to a lunch, and all mo any money left over will be for a tip so we can bless somebody else. But if you don't have the $20, don't sweat it. Talk to Garrison or myself or Pastor. We will make it happen. But um, it'll be a good time. Amen? Um, Sign-up sheet is in the back. Did we have any other announcements? Just the bake sale in the back. Is there? And, I, and we also have a bake sale in the back uh, raising money for, I think, camp. Yeah, camp. Did we have any birthdays or anniversaries this week? Anybody else? Yes. Oh. Did I miss anybody? No. If we could have birthdays stand in here, we'll sing happy birthday. A happy birthday to you, a happy birthday to you. May you feel Jesus near every day of the year. Happy birthday to you, a happy birthday to you. And the best one you've ever had. Hallelujah. And I don't think we had any anniversaries. 
All right, if we could stand in the house of the Lord this morning. Sister Katie, will you dismiss us in prayer this morning? <laughs> Pray for me. <laughs> Brother Larry, will you dismiss us this morning? Amen.